to be as evil as possible to as many black people in Africa as possible. Like, yeah. make, and then and then making it so that they're like trying to get us so they're drinking urine and, and feces. That's that's the most insane evil thing, man. Yes, sir. I can hear you, and we're live. How are you? Can you hear me? I'm doing wonderfully well. How you doing, Jay? Awesome, dude. So glad you're here. How's your uh, stream deck? It's awesome. I was about to tell everybody that I have Rich Grove to thank for all the fanciness. I mean, it's just kind of like mind-blowing here. Look at this. Look at this. A document cam with uh, the Blade trilogy. Look at that. Wesley Snipes versus the IRS. Document now I, I don't see that on my end, but I hope I your viewers no, we're are not seeing bad that. That's good. They're seeing, no, that's good. All right. Yeah, they're seeing the actual Blade trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> and now they're seeing me and you. And uh yeah, I've got you all sized up. Now what um, happens if I if I push my buttons and I got uh what, document cam or you know stuff like that? Dueling document what, cams. We can what get what happens what we, happens then? Yeah, we can get next level nerd. <laughs> well ask chat gpt what to do that thing is a, a damn slanderer man somebody asked that thing about me and it was way off man so the ai is not <laughs> not doing that great that ai is a bunch it's a, a lie it's not yeah, AI. That's, that's good take on it that's good take on it so guys welcome everybody if you would uh hit like and share everybody's just rolling in we're live with rich you know what? It's it's been too long. It was two years. I was looking at our last interview, <clears throat> and um, that's all your fault. No, I'm just joking. That's a kind of a 
No, it's, that's the uh, the Great Reset's fault. It's kept us right. busy for the past two years. I think it was, yeah, it was probably probably January two years ago we talked about Klaus. It was. Klaus. We did a whole two yeah. hours. And uh, yeah. that one got a lot of views somehow. It ended up getting like 150,000 views, which my channel is never, ever allowed to have that. So here we are two years later. By the way, that studio looks sweet, dude. I'm always, I just don't like, it's like Richard has the sweetest setup for stand and you're standing up too like you're not sitting yeah it's right? really it's really yeah uh, it's utilitarian because i'm just there's just stacks of books like there's just you know i'm just surrounded by stacks of books this is this is the library that i put uh the studio into so it's just books all around and i noticed and, the other uh, day that you're there you're actually standing up which is a good idea you're yeah not sitting down yeah because uh, uh yesterday for instance i was here at the desk from noon to like four and then from nine till 5 a.m well so i was I googling was why down, why you, why it's that way and the internet said that it's because you're thick with two c's t-h-i-c-c you got <laughs> you got thunder thighs you're thick you try to keep those glutes and those thunder thighs worked out that's what our that's what the internet said yeah i find i stay more mentally awake when i'm standing than if i was here sitting for that long so in the studio behind me, I'll sit and teach for a while, but I like to do Q and a uh, and any type of research where I have to grab books and use the document cam and field questions and that sort of stuff in here. Well, welcome everybody today. It's uh it's different. Like we're not going to be doing a, the usual kind of madness that I do uh, because I have, you know, one of the smartest guys out there. Uh, there's not many people that I learn from <clears throat> when I, when I go on uh, my podcast feed, I'm listening to things that teach me something. There's not a whole lot of those. One of those podcasts is Grand Theft World, so I'm really happy to have you, as you said, as a sponsor, and I think everybody needs to consistently uh, go and follow and listen to Grand Theft World. And you've been doing GTW for how long now? Several, several years, what, 100 plus, 150, 200? Yeah, we're episodes? like at 100, no, we're at 115, 115 episodes. Okay. We, we started on the election when it was the, like the Biden-Trump election, and uh, I'd bought the URL for Grand Theft World back in like, I don't know, 2010, 2012, because it was a concept. I was like, there's globalists, they're trying, it's Grand Theft World. But they hadn't made a move yet, and it was just mothballed. And then when things started picking up with COVID, I was like, you know, we should break out that URL and, and like start a podcast. And then one of the guys on my my media team came to me and said, would you like me to buy it? And I was like, no, I already own it. I've had it for like, you know, 10 years. And he's like, well, I can buy it right now. And I was like, oh, I must have let it lapse. So then we bought it back. So then I was, I was like, we have to do something with it. And then we uh, set up grandtheftworld.com and we started the podcast. It was, I think it was like November 2nd, 2020 or 2021, something like that. Nice. I'm having to resize you so that so that uh, I can good. be a little tiny man in the corner the way that you set it up. You, you, I remember you saying, Jay, I you want You could do you... split screens too. Like yeah. I, got, I got, you know, you could just set. What, you said something to the effect of, Jay, I want to be towering over you and I want you as a little <laughs> tiny man in the corner, I think is the way you worded it, but. I'm just being silly. No, this is it's great. It's fancy, man. I just can't get over it. And I have you to thank for that. He, everybody, it's Richard that sent me the stream deck. That's what I'm trying to say in too many words. Man, I well, want to get deep into the history. I want. I'm to get, a fan of your work. Thank and you. You're always holding. You're always holding books up to screen, and then you're doing like Infowars Fridays. And right. I'm just thinking about that audience too. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, I find it so useful. I use my I use my document cam like ten times a podcast, right? So there'll be something I can put right. in front of the audience, and it's more real to them, right? So I figured it would just up your production value, and then along with that, I had discovered the power of the stream deck, and I have them at all all the PC stations, and I sent them to everyone on the media team because you know LD needs a soundboard. I, he actually has the XL one and a regular one. I think he has a soundboard nice. on it and stuff, and. Um, there's a lot of versatility in it, so Elgato should probably give me sponsorship because I bought enough stuff from there yeah, over the right. years. But yeah, all the stuff I have and talk about, I use and I bought it. So happy to uh, to share that. It's a little thing that keeps on giving because, like, once you get used to using the buttons, you're like, oh, I don't have to touch the mouse anymore, and I can stay more in flow, and you know, uh, I can bring value to the audience more seamlessly. And it was something easy, especially since you went out of the way and you developed that 12 week course on, on philosophy, I was hoping you'd get that stuff and use it during the course, but you didn't need it. You, you had it all in lockdown, but just up in your production value as a fan, it was something easy for me to do for you. Yeah, it was awesome. I much appreciated. And <clears throat> I'm glad that we sat and had the time to actually figure it out. Cause I'm really uh, kind of procrastinate when it comes to that kind of stuff, but 
that's what you do over at Autonomy is that you really kind of help people not just learn specific coursework and discipline in terms of like actual uh, genres of philosophy and like that, but you actually do courses relating to everything, right? Business to self-help. I mean, help. I mean, it's a wide array of things over there, right? Yeah, the gist is, what did they take out of our regular education system to make us assume that authority is something we should be obedient to? Because, you know, it's like they have mind control, yes, but they can achieve the same effect by just getting people to assume that Dan Rather or Walter Cronkite is telling them the truth. And so by getting people to assume and getting inquiry out of our what used to be an education system, the schooling system's indoctrination, it uses declarative sentences. So there's no inquiry in pursuit of truth. They already have the answers. You just have to learn them. And so trying to backfill for people who are struggling in the world, which is most people who go through that system, like the system produces people who struggle, who are frustrated, who are learned helplessness, scarcity mentality, these sort of things. So you, they need triage. They need like splinting. They need to have a cast on. And after like, you know, 12 weeks, then they're all, you know, healed up and they can start growing in the light direction, writing their own script in life, being captain of their own ship, these sort of ideas. But you can't do that when you have all this mental muck and you can't do that until you have some methods of critical thinking to discern fact from fiction. And you can't do that until you learn how to inter like to communicate interpersonal communications with other people. So you have to think first and then you have something worth sharing that's valuable to others and provides utility. And so there's a multi-step process that people go through to kind of undo and then add on the things they need. So uh, and then we do have, because your observation is in the autonomy Agora, there's a bunch of different courses. Well, I go to colleagues and say, if you don't have some sort of flagship offer, what's the magnum opus of your value offering? Let's create something. So Stefan Verstappen was working on a book for uh, creating uh, communities that don't fight with each other and crush on their like crumble under their own weight. Because there's a lot of people trying to form like, uh, let's let's have a little hippie community and people will come live on the property and we'll have micro houses. Let's but have an you intentional have... community. Yeah. So unless you have like a covenant and a charter and things to keep like rules uh, to keep people like uh, their freedom insulated from each other so they don't infringe on each other's freedom without that setup, it's like doomed to fail. So he was writing a book and I said, that's. That's good. When are you gonna have your book done? Oh, someday maybe. Why don't you teach a course about your book and finish your book while you're writing a course? So you're teaching a course, but you're finishing a chapter each week in your book. So at the end, you have a book and you have a group of people who are educated about your book, want to read your book, will share your book. And then you also have an evergreen product for people to, if they read the book, come get the deeper explanation that he did once. And then he moves around and does things, but he keeps getting checks for that one thing he did. So if, uh, you know, the it, it might seem eclectic at the Autonomy Agora, where, you know, you got your course, Corbett's course, uh, Derek Rose's course, a whole bunch of other courses, Benny Wills's course. Actually, normally on Monday nights, I'd be watching Benny Wills and the meme over on the other YouTube channel, but I appreciate being here tonight. So these types of uh, influencers who already bring a lot of YouTube value, but we're struggling like with income and having things consistent so they can grow their business. Now they have these pieces in place. So, um, those are courses that are like done by influencers, but everything that we've done within autonomy is very strategic. So, you know, you have a budgeting course because we don't get taught budgeting or finance exactly. in high school, yeah. right? We don't. Lo yeah. Logic, critical thinking. These are other adjacent courses. So after people graduate autonomy, they have access to all the courses in the University of Reason as a graduate, and they could just go through all these other courses. But autonomy is the flagship to kind of prime them for continued growth through the rest of their life. Awesome. Yeah, and what we did, what I just did, was the 12-week course uh, on the history of Western philosophy, and we worked from the pre-Socratics all the way up to the modern period. Uh, right before <clears throat> we get to the 20th century, uh, we kind of ended it with Nietzsche, postmodernism, existentialism, and um, you know we might do another course down the road, but uh, uh, happy to say that that's all complete, and I want to thank Richard for that opportunity. Everything uh, turned out, you know, exactly like we thought like i wanted so it was perfect and uh that is on sale now so if you guys do want to get access to the course there is a link in the show description for the philosophy course it ended up being 35 ish if you count the q a maybe even 40 hours worth of 
uh, of, lect of lecture. There's also, you know, edited video slides and all that as well as the audio. So it's not just, you know, me rambling or whatever. It's actually a really well-produced full-on philosophy course. And the aim was to make it basically better than what you would get in a, you know, university setting, better than what you would get uh, at the local school, some guy was talking shit on YouTube. He was like, your course is basically the same price as community college. And I'm like, well, dude, if you think my the quality of my work is community college, then go yeah, to right. community college. You really think that uh, some goober at community college, right, is going to actually know anything about all the stuff that Richard and I talk about? Of course not. So, yeah. So uh, have fun at community college and, you know, sink a bunch of money into a worthless piece of paper. This is what education should be, teaching you to critically think, teaching you how to teach yourself. In fact, I was just listening to the day tapes. We're going to be doing a whole lecture series on that. I don't know, maybe not a lecture series, but maybe a couple shows on uh, the Dr. Day tapes. And uh, they actually talked about that, uh, how to completely change education, even beyond where it was, uh, you know, well, I, it, roughly around the same time as, as what uh, Charlotte Isabit and the Dumbing Down was talking about. But mm. this is a whole other layer of it to where they wanted to, to make education into something um, even more of a socializing thing. In other words, not even more of, a, of a, a mechanism to integrate you into society to be a cog and even less critical thinking was actually stated at the Rockefeller in 1969 a population control uh, um, a conference that Dr. Day headed up and education was one of the key things on the agenda as well as the rest of society basically being put into a great reset which is what we're seeing now so uh, don't forget the day tapes everybody we're gonna be talking about that very soon but again thank you again for the opportunity go go subscribe to the philosophy course there's also payment options and a lot of people asked they said what what about this next season so the way that's going to work is I think in the next season that Richard teaches his next uh, set of courses, uh, I'm going to time it as well to be uh, there live for that. So what you get with the bonus, if you want the, the bonus option there, you get access to the uh, as long as you want Q&A. So basically the lectures stay the same. You can buy the flat price of the DIY. You just want to breeze through the lectures, don't care about uh, a one-on-one -on -one tutoring scenario. That's fine. That's why the extra option is there where I come back next season we watch it episode by episode, then I'm there with you, and we do as long as you want in the Q&A tutoring. It might go three hours, might go four hours. I'm fine with whatever you guys want to do. And uh, that's the genius that Richard has uh, set up over there. That's what Autonomy University is. That's the future of education, obviously, is online learning. When the, the Learning what you want to learn in order to fit in in a real way. In other words, not fitting into some stupid socialized system, but fitting in in the sense of so it really works. And we have to know how the world really works to understand how the elites stole the world and how we can take it back, right? Would you agree with that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And we can go down that path, but I also want to, I want to, because sure. yeah. you got, you got pushed back on your price and that's, that's cute that people give you pushback on your price. First off, pushback on your price doesn't have anything to do with your offer. It has to do with their cash flow position at the time that your offer is presented to them. So there's always a discernment for a business owner to say, is your pushback on the value I'm offering or the price I'm attaching it to or your cash flow position when it meets that price? And a lot of people, 95 to 99% will say, no, it's a cash flow issue, at which point you can make payment arrangements. You can break it up and you know do whatever. You can have a smaller course. You can have uh, something that's kind of like a, a half, half the philosophy course or something like that, right? And they could buy the rest later. At least you know what you're dealing with. But when people were like, oh, your price is too high in community college. First off, I've taken because, uh, you know, 20 years ago, they started putting all these curriculum online. So when that happened, I went to Yale online and I took their philosophy courses and I went to Oxford and Harvard. And I was like, this is what Ivy League students are being taught. And then I went out and studied these things for myself. And I discovered the short shrift that all those students are getting. Now, a course like yours, it's a misnomer. It's not philosophy one on one. It's like philosophy unleashed. It's the history and evolution of philosophy. Right. It's more like a complementary piece to the story of philosophy by Will Durant. Exactly. Something a hundred years ago that stands the test of time and is evergreen. You can go back to Jay's course a hundred years from now. Be like, oh, this is what happened in the past couple thousand years of philosophy. Thank you very much. So, thank you know, thank you for 
dedicating 12 weeks of your time running parallel to me teaching. You started like on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. I started on a Friday. We both went 12 weeks through there and uh, you were very easy to work with. You were very prompt. Everybody loved your content, especially the comedy that you bring to it to keep it, you know, uh, fun. And um, yeah, your Q&A sessions were fired, dude. Thanks, man. Excellent. Um, yeah. So uh, again, guys, there are multiple options. You can go over there and sign up uh, with payment plan as well. And we're going to have a lot of fun if you do want the the uh, full price option with the next semester doing the live Q&A. All right. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's a little bit of lag issues. Of course, it always happens whenever I'm, whenever I'm streaming at night uh, at a perfect time with a perfect guest. That's when the internet just seems to want, I've paid like the craziest amount of fees and prices for the best, highest level streaming and it just goes nuts. Do you want me to do a backup recording for you? Um, no, it's not really the, it's, it's you can, it's not that, it's the, uh, it's the speed. So, speed. All yeah. right, I got you. I mean, I've had the truck out here multiple times. I've had them fixing it. I've had every, I've done everything you can do possibly. Uh, it just does this sometimes on certain nights. It's really random. There's no rhyme or reason. It's just Mark Zuckerberg uh, effing with me, basically, is all it is. Um, so last time we talked about Klaus, we did a whole, yeah. I think, two-hour thing. This time, I want to get into the history of the power structure in the 20th century. Let's rewind. Let's go back to... Um, if somebody asks you, Richard, how, how is it that an elite clique of people were able to basically steal the world? That's the grand theft world. How do they steal the world? Like, how do you even go about that? How do you even plan that? seems like you would need to control certain institutions and kind of have a long game plan. That would seem to be point number one. Where do you want to kick it off in terms of the 20th century elite? I know we can go back to the 19th century with Cecil Rhodes and all that. So I, but I would ask a question. If I gave you a money printing machine and a monopoly on nation state has to buy money from you on a profit how long is it going to take you to take over the world 50 100 years we've been at, at the federal reserve game for like 113 years something like that 100 yeah, i don't want to do math but it's, it's a little over 100 years and with that the value of the dollar is just decreased and that that graph of the dollar decreasing is the same as if i had a swimming pool full of water and i put a pump in there and the water if you looked at the curve it would just you know, at a constant rate, it would just decrease. So it looks like the Federal Reserve is a pump used to drain the wealth out of America. And that pump's about to run dry. And just at that time when it's about to run dry, people want to drop the petrodollar and they want to bring in CDBCs, Great Reset, Carbon Credits, Social Credit Score, Technocracy, all this other stuff. It almost seems like since 1971 with Bretton Woods and taking us off the gold standard that this is that was them pulling the drain. And saying when it runs out, that's when we flip the switch. And the Economist in 1988-89 had the the Phoenix on the cover with the new world currency that they were calling for uh, by 2018. So they're a couple years off their plan, and they're calling their shots, but they're very much still serious about what they're doing. And the inclusive capitalism movement that kind of backs this is also part and parcel. So there's a lot of moving parts, but it's all pretty much the same plan. It's a finite planet, and there's only so many people doing this. Yeah, I think I think the most uh, telling point was right away when you when you open up Tragedy and Hope, you find Quigley talking about the promissory notes that the banks were uh, allowed to issue as private banks that would then sell these uh, notes, as you said, to various countries. Uh, the central banking model and Quigley basically describes this as a scam, and it's 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 a scam as you dive deeper into this, in my view that is basically stealing generational wealth and energy. And so when you think about wealth or money as a means to store energy, to store value over time, then we can really understand what money is and what its purpose should be and what ethical money then should be as opposed to unethical money like fiat money. And once we understand that, I mean, that's really the central, like, cent I mean, it's central bank. It's the, that's the central control mechanism, right? The central bank of central banks is the bank for international settlements. It's the private of the private federal reserves. And that's the kind of one that sets the policy for the rest of the central banks in this whole big spider web system. That's number one. I mean, there's a lot of elements, a lot of key pieces to this whole uh, superstructure, how it works. 
but, but the that's BIS a... came along after Federal Reserve. So Federal Reserve is is international bank, banking's stronghold, gets a foothold in America. And then from there, America gets into World War One. And in between World War One and one World War Two is when BIS comes in in Basel, Switzerland, right? And then you've got uh, Helmar, Horace Greeley, Schacht, and Montague Norman, and these other characters. So the Bank of England and Hitler's banker working together, the Bank of International Settlements. And Hitler's banker was a guy from Brooklyn, Horace Greeley, Schacht. And so it's a very interesting dynamic that is sit there, set there by the same people who funded the Hitlerian Nazi project. Yeah, the, the Schroeder place. Bank. This and it, yes, Dulles uh, worked uh, at that same bank before going on to be, you know, one of the early CIA heads. So uh, keep in keep in mind that this is something we tried to illustrate. You know, when I had you on with uh, the fourth hour of AJ uh, a couple months ago, is that. This is really a managed dialectic in the 20th century. That's really crucial to understand because if we can understand communism, socialism, monopoly capitalism as a kind of uh, power move, chess move, chess piece, uh, what's going to happen to chess piece face? To, to quote, they might be giants, might be giants. Uh, then we uh, we can understand that we're not we're not in a different situation now. The situation we're in now is also the same power blocks that operate behind a cover of nation states it's not actually governments going you know after one another it's high level monopoly corporations that are above governments that are run by the same people that as you pointed out had set up these institutions including global banking institutions which now do run the world right i mean isn't it funny by the way that the bis for so long said that bitcoin was this awful thing it was terrible and now i'll suddenly uh, by the way uh you should have two percent on your uh, balance sheets of bitcoin the bis just said last month so uh, even the BIS has kind of caved into <laughs> to the reality of uh, of what ethical money is. Because I think because they're forced to. I don't think it's because of some grand conspiracy on the part of Bitcoin. I think they're just forced to it because the existing system seems to be going away. And I know that in some degree that was planned for. Um, there's always the opportunity that we can put, present and put forward something better. We don't have to be enslaved by all this stuff. But... Um, Let's go back then to the to the 1890s, the 1900s, and what what was going on at this time in terms of we see the British Empire kind of uh, waning, beginning to wane, but we have the idea that a new order could be created. Some of these British lords, Lord uh, Lionel Curtis, for example, he said, "Let's create this global Commonwealth." He called it the Commonwealth of God, and he said, "We'll make it democratic, but not really democratic. We'll just call it democratic." But it will actually be a kind of a covert mega socialist federation using the ideology of John Ruskin and others. Uh, and so why why would big money people want something that's like big socialism? I mean, I know you know this, but for the sake of people who are kind of learning this now, you know, seeing Klaus with a bust of V.I. Lenin behind him. Why are, why are wealthy people so enamored with, with Marxism and socialism? Well, it's a, well, let's go back to your idea of generational wealth and reappropriation and pillage and plunder of people's wealth. Communism, socialism can do it really quick. They're like uh, a rook or a bishop on the chessboard, whereas their appropriation of our banking system and outsourcing of Congress coining money and then saying the Federal Reserve can print money, but it's not part of the government, right? That exporting of that, um, that's more like a knight, right? It's not its not making these great leaps forward. It moves in this set pattern and methodically, systematically, it'll get to the other side. But it's not able to just go across the board where overnight communism can reappropriate people's property and everything like that. Uh, what you mentioned about Curtis and the Commonwealth. That comes around in his Columbia lectures, like 1926. So, uh, and then and then the backstory to that is, you know, 100 years earlier, the Fabian Society was created. And in between, let's go like this. In this book, Pilgrim Society and Public Democracy, uh, there's a quote by Conan Doyle. You know, the guy who writes Sherlock Holmes, who inspired the Baker Street Irregular Spies. of. Well, I wanted to ask you about that, century. yeah, because you're one of the few people I've uh, read, or I mean, excuse me, not, not read, but had heard that had uh, mentioned this fact that I've read, which is that, I mean, that Mycroft is British intelligence, and uh, that's explicit in the stories, and that's because 221B Baker Street is actually a, uh, it's a location for British intelligence uh, in reality. 
So yes. that's supposed to be hinting at what, what you're getting at. Yeah. So back, uh, this is a page 75 of the book founding of society in December, 1895, shortly after Grover Cleveland's message to the United States Congress regarding the Venezuelan border crisis, Conan Doyle had written a letter to the London times in which he said he wanted to see an Anglo American society started in London with branches all over the empire for the purpose of promoting good feeling, smoothing over friction, laying literature before the public propaganda, which will show them how strong the arguments are in favor of Anglo American Alliance. So that's the Times, 1896. And then it goes back down here. Uh, Holmes quote, the Holmes quote is demonstrative of desires for a sort of Anglo-Saxon union uh, that were held by people like William Stead and Cecil Rhodes. See Conan Doyle, The Adventures of the Noble Bachelor, and it gives the references, right? So this whole idea of ameliorating the Americans back in with the British is an idea that started... I think with, yeah, you're right, Ruskin, his influence on Rhodes. And while Rhodes is often in South Africa with the De Beers and the Diamonds and getting Rothschild funding, Conan Doyle is is back there uh, doing some writing. Uh, and when you think of the spy novelists of the British genre and other science fiction writers like H.G. Wells, you got Conan Doyle, you got Kipling, right? So there, uh, there's a lot of MI6-ish agents, because it might be predating their agency, that uh, were authors and writers and creators of public narratives, which I also think is, is really interesting. So the history of them wanting to get back together, I think it starts after 1814 at the Battle of New Orleans, where Andrew Jackson kicked them out. And then they had to go refocus their efforts. So after they take their eyes off America... They go over, let's see, uh, 1805, Napoleon is going against the Prussians and uh, defeats them. And then during that time, Napoleon's scourge into that area creates um, William of Hesse to take his money to Meyer Amschel Rothschild and hide it by sending it over to London, where Nathan Rothschild will take that money and invest it in the East India Company or something. Wellington gets paid. He goes and defeats uh, Napoleon at Waterloo, and then Meyer Amsh or Nathan Rothschild gets word early and kind of corners the market. The 1938 film House of Rothschild is a family authorized Academy Award winning biopic, and it depicts pretty much what I just. Uh, it's family friendly uh, as well. It's, a, it's, it's very wonderful. Very friendly, Disney. Family friendly. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, yeah, that is that is a fun movie. I remember watching that back in the in the days uh, of like early conspiracy YouTube, you know, like or maybe even Google Video era. I remember I remember watching that then. So by the time they get that, they they kind of they saved the British Empire from the opium monopoly and the two opium wars that were going on, right? And there's a whole bunch of Jardine Matheson and you know Alliance Assurance Company that the Rothschilds created to ensure they didn't do the shipping, but they insured the ships, right? So there's a built uh carnegie their fundings coming from the european money network and then when they're done expanding through america all these robber barons start uh industrializing soviet union what would be the soviet union and communist china so without the industrialization from these western countries you wouldn't have had these big communist experiments to reappropriate generational wealth in the first place and then during that time they came back they got a they got a good foothold in America like 1848, 1850s, because the Rothschild agent for America was named August Belmont. And he became influence um in transportation and infrastructure and subways and all these sort of things. So while you've got America being developed with their money, there's not in exchange to bring America into World War One. Now that's according to a whistleblower named Benjamin Friedman in his book called Facts or Fact. He was at the Paris conference. He was one of the businessmen that was involved with these dealings. And 1961, he blew the whistle. Are you muted, dude? Oh. This is this uh, key point when the Society of the Elect, which is the uh, Rhodes uh, Empire. Right. So in 1919 Peace Conference of Paris, Society of the Elect, now headed by Rhodes' friend Lord Milner, later, uh, uh, later titled the Milner Group, was in collaboration with the Fabian Society and the Morgan Group in the United States to conceive an American organ uh, Anglo-American organization known as the Institute of International Affairs. And you may have heard of this because this eventually becomes things that we are familiar with, known uh, things like the CFR. So this evolves into a situation where 
um, it becomes kind of a, a higher than the intelligence apparatus, uh, super intelligence uh, type of thing. John Maynard Keynes, Philip Noel Barker, as well as many uh, Fabians and LSC professors like Arnold Toynbee, later became the Chatham House Director of Studies with Lord Astor. These leading millinerites were then able to set up <clears throat> what would come what would come to be called the OSS and the CIA because their connections with John Foster and Alan Dulles of Wall Street through the for firm Sullivan and Cromwell uh, allowed them to establish this, what would become a permanent secret national security apparatus, which would be the real power structure in America. And that, of course, uh, allowed <clears throat> J.P. Morgan, together with the Carnegie Trust and J.D. Rockefeller, uh, to align the industrial base in America, including Ford Motor Comp uh, Company, with the Bank of England, Lazar Brothers, and Rothschild and Sons. And so this is all the elements that come together to produce the Royal Institute for International Affairs' version of uh, the, the Roundtable in America, uh, which, is, which becomes uh, Chatham House, which becomes the CFR. So here you have right here, and that's also the same people like involved in the Pilgrim Society that Richard was showing you. Um, this is where the CFR comes comes from, right? And this is crucial to understand because if, if we don't understand this, and then here's the 1919 Peace Conference page from Ratsu's uh, history book, which gets into their use of theosophy. And we've been covering this a lot lately because so many of the spies were into and involved in theosophy because theosophy... It's kind of a great cover for doing various intelligence operations, especially given the fact that a lot of the, the KGB and people in the Soviet Union were into theosophy. So this allowed a lot of the a lot of the <clears throat> discourse to occur between people like Blavatsky, Bailey, Bassant, all of whom were pretty much 100% uh, committed theosophists, to interact with uh, people like Nicholas Rorick, people who were influencing you know fdr's uh what was his name wallace the vice president yeah right henry wallace yeah who were you know avowed uh 100 committed socialists and into the occult um and put that symbol on that creepy symbol in the back of the dollar like that's, yeah, yeah. That's you, you may have seen the, the, an yeah. eye on the dollar bill so maybe that has a significance that's from these theosophists who were basically in my view again just a kind of a front spy network for the supra British uh, power structure, Rothschild power structure that we're talking about. That's that's who this is. Same people. Yeah, the the overlap between theosophy and Fabian socialism is is huge, particularly like Arthur Balfour and these sorts the sorts of people that are involved in this Rhodes Roundtable Rothschild British Empire kind of agenda that overlaps with uh, theos uh, theosophy and the Eastern spiritualism that's brought into Western context kind of as a pseudo secret society situation that they're also using, you know, these are people who play with other people. So that they think they're special and they get these little ideas and they cling on to them. I wanted to touch real quick <laughs> on the, uh, the round table. Cause when you're talking about Cecil Rhodes and he died and there was this round table group and Milner's kindergarten and society, they elect, it's all kind of the same thing. Right. There's many names for this group, but the round table is a, a common name for it. And I was a little incredulous. So back in the day, I, I looked them up and, and I said, uh, who is it? Who is this round table group? What are they all about? This is the round table. This is volume four from 1913, 1914. So right when World War One is kicking off, these are the official papers. Let me show you. Uh, it's a big, thick book. It's like a Bible size book. And you open it up. And I have the other volumes, too. I just figured the Irish question. What are they going to do with the Irish, Jay? Oh, they got crushed down in the Irish. Islam and Empire, United Kingdom, Canada. Like, so they're going over. This is a quarterly well, they, and this, review. The same with the Germans in the post war period. I just read the chapter in this where Morgenthau plan uh, involved not just starving the Germans, but actually um, re education camps yes. by Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam's re education yeah. camps for Germans. Well, the, the Rhodes Group in South Africa, and, and, uh, they pioneered re-education camps and concentration camps so this is a quarterly review of the politics of the british empire and so that goes through all their different you know states uh commonwealths whatever you want to call them later they're later called commonwealths and uh provides news of the empire and so it's like their their chronology of how the empire grows and it's a really fascinating set of books and uh the, you know, when you get into how, looking how, at how they look at other people, right? So this is written from the English speaking people have the right 
you know, according to Darwin, uh, to rule over everybody and that the Irish are inferior. Let's start with them. And um, yeah, so going through the politics of the empire, you can start to see how the empire thinks, how the empire acts, what's the government's naval policy in certain times of, of war. And then these couple with um, other books that I have on the top shelf, which are Lord Grey's papers, Colonel House's private papers, and those were used in Corbett's World War One conspiracy series because these guys actually had conversations. Like you can read uh, uh, Milner, uh, no, sorry, Mil uh, not Milner, but Colonel House's side, Lord Grey's side, and in between is like King Edward. And they're having this conversation like, uh, if the Lusitania were sunk or, you know, would America get into the war and these sort of things. And then once they come to a decision, like a couple hours later, that happens almost like someone checked a box and like it went, you know, sent, sent for filing. And so you see that happen in world war one and Winston Churchill's in room 40 when it happens and he gets promoted, becomes a big hero about 20 years later. Right. So he had a rise of power. Then in world war two, same sort of thing happens where British intelligence is running spies that knew about and helped to plan Pearl Harbor and neglected to tell their special relationship partners, the Americans in order to have America in their side on the war, another world war. So, so since what then, you're been saying Ben managers. Affleck and Cuba Gooding Jr. Didn't save America during Pearl Harbor. Yeah. I am. Yeah. Alec Baldwin did not fly the, Enola he didn't Day. fly the, yeah, the bombing of Tokyo mission to, firebomb tokyo but um <laughs> i mean it's funny because that that we just rewatched that movie jamie and i and that whole movie was it's pretty wild how much that's about the big like that's prepping everybody for the big nine event because as you know you know the pnag document There's a new pearl harbor pnag document yeah. calls for a new pearl harbor and pearl harbor comes out uh several months before the big nine event and I don't think that's accidental. I mean, that's clearly a movie made in consultation with, you know, the military, the deep state, Pentagon, CIA, huge there's, propaganda. There's another film. movie that came out right before 9-11, uh, Mel Gibson's Patriot, like year 2000, maybe something like that. It was before 9-11. Right. Patriotism and, had to be ramped up. Right. The, and, the and opening this, scene, Mel Gibson is in the barn working on a, a, a rocking chair and he puts it on a scale and he says nine pounds, 11 ounces. Perfect. Perfect. Now, I don't know about you, but who's making nine pound rocking chairs and why is that the perfect weight? But in a foreshadowing, you know, revelation of the method, just drop these things like the lone gunman. There's a whole bunch of pieces of media out there, just like you can right. go back to Dean Koontz and see Wuhan lab in the 1980s. Wuhan, yeah. Right. Like that whole. Yeah, so uh, the the people who like to play games with other people. Uh, create secret societies they hide useful information so that they can appear to have some sort of control and they don't like people being educated and looking into the actual facts of the matter right so like um you just referenced the pnac new pearl harbor document right and that's that's where most people get that because that was 1999 or 2000 i think the, the rad plan was 2000 do you know there's a document two years before that that basically says the same thing and that the people who wrote it had a really interesting rise to power afterwards. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, not necessarily. No, I have a foreign affairs council of foreign uh, affairs, a foreign relations, council of foreign relations, foreign affairs uh, journal over here. And in 1998, they, uh, there was two art. Let me just show it to you. Let me show it. Yeah. While he's getting that, I wanted to note that, um, one thing I mentioned, I think, on, on Lord Voldemort the other day uh, was that I didn't know that when <clears throat> and it quickly goes into quite a bit of detail about the U.S.'s role in reconstructioning in the reconstruction of Germany after the war. But what he doesn't go into a lot of detail about is the actual propaganda and psyops that Uncle Sam used. And what I didn't realize was that the post-war Germany psyops that were he. he, he the book mentions psychological warfare, but what I didn't realize was that they, they intentionally did a lot of experimentation with how to train Germans and Europeans to think in a different way and try to get them to not be what they had always considered German. For example, they were very into industry. One of the things they wanted to do was turn them into more of an agrarian focused society to get rid of German industry because Germany was a powerhouse, the, the powerhouse of of industry in Europe. They had to deindustrialize 
Germany to make it something that would fit into the EU, and the EU was dreamt up by all of these, uh, the, the same Milner crew, uh, according to Ratio, which I think he demonstrates that in, in a, uh, a few chapters from the Schumann plan, these different socialists d d that drew up the EU. He argues that the purpose of the EU was basically to control and manipulate and situate Germany such that they would be kept down. <clears throat> but what I didn't know was the depth to which they had done cultural creation experimentation, something that we you know talk about a lot over here. My books are about that. So they had really taken wartime experimentation in culture creation. And then if you think about that, what they were doing in post-war times, and think about American culture. Think about how, like Richard just said, we were told before 9-11, oh, you got to be super patriotic. Now uh, America is a bad thing, right? Now it's racist, misogynist, sexist, chauvinist, and misogynist. I'm trying to think of that Hillary song, right? Now that's what America represents has to be bad. And that's all part of the same psyops to entrain and re-pattern uh, and re-imprint to use the MK Ultra terminology, the the Americans and the, specifically those in the heartland to fit into this global order. And all I'm saying is that the processes and the technology had been perfected in the post wartime reconstruction experimentation. It's the same thing with the Phoenix program in Vietnam. It's just more sophisticated, different types of stuff. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent, dude. <clears throat> and uh, the Count Calergy plan that was formulated back in like the 1920s. It, it turned out like the, the EU is a prototype for the unionization of various regions on the yep. planet to make a global super state. I mean, that, that's the gist. And th these people, I don't know, all these people who say it's conspiracy theory, they've just been gaslighting us for so long. When you start to look at this evidence, it's just like these people are ignorant and they don't know any better. So they gaslight you because they feel like they well, they'd be uninformed if this was going on and they didn't know about it. So they'd rather gaslight you and tell you it doesn't exist than. You know, so here's an artifact. Let me put it like this. This is Foreign Affairs, November, December, 1998. You got Madeline Albright, but she doesn't make the list. This one, Combating Catastrophic Terrorism, Ashton Carter, John Deutsch, Philip Zelikow. Well, he becomes famous later. And also this Bernard Lewis explains Osama bin Laden, foreshadowing what might happen in 2001. Now, there's also... Oh, these are the people, but that's just great because yeah. these are the people, too, that, uh, like, Bernard Lewis is uh, Samuel Huntington's uh, mentor. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so we're making traction there. So there's a lot of people connected to this document, and a lot of interesting things happen after this because right after this catastrophic terrorism document, you've got uh, the PNAC document, but you've also got the 9-11 terrorist attack, and a lot of these people that were involved in creating these plans are also involved in benefiting shortly after the crime. So if we go back to this artifact, we can open it up. We see Peter G. Peterson and Paul Wolfowitz and these other characters who are participating. They might also be in the uh, the regime that comes up in two years, right? Wolfowitz was later in the W. Bush regime. So this first article, License to Kill, License to Kill Osama Bin Laden's Declaration of Jihad. Now, you notice it's spelled Usama. Whenever it's spelled Usama, this is British Empire propaganda because we spell it Osama over here, right? So it's important to discern uh, the sources of this. Now, this talks about Us Usama bin Laden's crusade, uh, uh, you know, World Islamic Front for Jihad against the Jews and the Crusaders. So Usama bin Laden is an anti-Zionist and he doesn't like Crusaders. Okay, good. That's basically what it's about. So now let's go later in this article, later in the same issue. Catastrophic terrorism, tackling the new danger, weapons of mass destruction. Oh, so first off, Ashton Carter is a Ford Foundation professor of science. John Deutsch is an MIT professor and former Central Intelligence and Deputy Secretary, Secretary of Defense. Philip Zelikow, a former member of the National Security Staff. Interesting, because after writing this article, he becomes the guy in charge of the 9-11 Commission report. But his PhD was on how to create public myths. Yeah. Very interesting character. So this is page 80. And if we go just over here, elaborate international networks have developed among organized criminals, drug traffickers, arms dealers, and money launderers, creating an infrastructure for catastrophic terrorism around the world. Yes, it's called NATO? No, sorry. Uh, weapons of mass destruction, World Trade Center, catastrophic terrorism, like Pearl Harbor, this event would divide our past and the future into a before and after the United States. So it just goes on. So it's a whole prototype for the neocon strategy that came out a couple years later. And uh, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, also Robert Gates. Didn't he have a rise to fame? That's a great, uh, great find. Yeah, so being able to kind of track them in their own words is an essential element of study. And I've got CFR foreign affairs that go back into like 1950s. I don't have all of them, but I have many of these interesting because it's it's them foreshadowing what they're going to do it's them calling their shots but they speak in like their twilight language so you can't discern exactly but like when you see china real big and russia real small like china's like a good thing and russia's a bad thing you can tell where they're going with their policies and these sort of demonizations of other nation states yeah absolutely and uh i dug out this whole thing which I had I had this copy back in the day. Uh, it's my Mass Control, which I'd forgotten. Oh, about. Oh, Jim Keith. Yeah, I yeah. I forgot about this book, and then uh, I read it back in like two thousand three, uh, three, four, five, somewhere in there. And then I gave my copy away, and it was out of print forever and ever and ever. And I finally, after you were talking about it the other day with Tony, I noticed that it popped up uh, a copy on Amazon, so I, I bought it right away. But yeah, so um, that's a classic too, and I, I don't mean to change the topic. It's just that uh, you—it's no, a live stream, dude. We can go wherever you want. You brought it up with Tony, and I was like, "Man, I got to get get that book back because that's a classic of MK Ultra." And uh, I did find one of the rare copies that were out there, but <clears throat> yeah, I mean, um, some of the other ones on MK Ultra "Battle for the Mind" by William Sargent, where he goes through like shell shock and PTSD, and yep. then how after you go through the phases, you're demoralized after. And I was like, wow, this looks this looks like the same thing they did to people during COVID. And now they get the same results. So it's almost like they gave everyone this PTSD shell shock therapy that they had been working on, you know, count like uh symbiotically with the Tavistock Institute. Yeah, and also this doesn't exist, right? Because I I, <clears throat> I show these doc that these books to various uh, people on the on the internet and they tell me that it doesn't exist so here's here's the non-existent jose delgado's physical control of the mind this book doesn't exist either um anyway but <clears throat> this is a classic too shout out to tristan i just got this in the mail and uh are you familiar with molecular vision of life by lily k this is oh a, yeah dude yeah I'm big fan of that one okay yeah we just got that one in so shout out to Trist- beautiful tristana for uh, her recommendation of that classic but <clears throat> Yeah, that's Rockefeller, Caltech, and the new new biology, which is just rebranding of eugenics. Exactly. Now, you got that uh, control book. Do you have this one? Human Use of Human Beings, Cybernetics and Society by Norbert Wiener? No, I have a different book by Norbert Wiener on cybernetics, but not that one. Yeah, there's a a couple of them I have. One of these covers, there's a cover for this book that shows like people working inside of gears. It's really creepy. So you can just tell what they're up to. Like he's the human use of human beings. But he brought you cruise control, so don't complain about things. Well, I was just going through the day tapes today, and um, <clears throat> that's going to be important because there's so many things in that that I, if you've not heard that, I'm going to send it to you. Yeah, they were they were like 1967, right? Uh, well, the the meeting was 69, and then he, okay. le- he leaked all that. I think in the 80s. The, the Dr. Dunnigan, who was an attendee there, who happened to be pro-life and was like, hey, wait a minute, why are we going yeah. to why are we gonna kill everybody? <laughs> yeah, I have, but, I have heard those tapes, yeah. Yeah, and so, uh, but it, it, he goes really deep into, um, the reason it's more relevant now is that most of the stuff in that is stuff that's rolling out right now. Mandatory stabbies, um, b- being able to flip your biology, supposedly, right? That was all stuff mentioned in those tapes. And I think a lot of people thought, oh, well, that's just conspiracy tapes. You know, it's a theory. We could put it in the theory domain. But given how much of this has actually come to pass, I mean, I think that this is this was a real, absolutely 100% a real meeting. Uh, and they, it was a real plan. I mean, the, the, the euthanasia, the death care is rolling out right now. And that was something that Dr. Day mentioned uh, in his lecture was that in the future, we're going to roll out uh, euthanasia. But what I wanted to go to with you was that there's this wild section where he says um, universities are going to have to be completely changed because what we're going to do is purge all of the university libraries of any of the books that contain real information. So in 1969, they were saying they would have to purge universities. And they said, we will even send people out to, um, if if the universities won't comply, 
He, he says, we'll literally just steal the books and get rid burn them. This is like Fahrenheit 451 level stuff that the Rockefeller Foundation was planning in 1969 to purge the universities. Okay, now you say, oh, well, that's crazy. That's wild. Uh, pretty crazy. Well, I went to my university that uh, I attended for the last 10 years or 15 years, I guess. It, I wasn't there for the last five years, but I've been at going to university for forever. Anyway, and uh, I was a big fan of the library. Number one, I love books. Uh, I'm kind of a, a Chad nerd dude. My whole audience, we're all Chad nerds over here. Richard's a Chad nerd. <clears throat> and we used to have a really awesome reference. Like down, like the whole downstairs of the university was was had a lot of stuff, right? We had a lot of old books, old Warburg letters, and you know, like banking elite letters. I mean, I found all kinds of gems down there. The years that I worked as a research assistant in the in grad school. I kid you not, I went to uh, back to the university maybe a few months ago, six months ago, and I went down, I was just checking out the reference section and when whatnot, all of the history and philosophy section, and I kid you not, they had purged probably 50 to 60% of all of it. The yeah. entire theology section, by the way, which they actually had a really uh, sizable theology section. They had an entire really rare uh, collection of the church fathers, which goes for several thousand dollars. It was the entire Catholic University uh, press set. That was all gone, purged. The only things left, I kid you not, was a couple shelves of Marxist works and Marxism. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I can, but I can't. So the universities have actually begun to do this. Now they'll say, oh, we had to scale down because of we don't need books anymore and everybody's using it. I mean, but this is an intentional plan to oh, not yeah. have you reading books. And they're purging universities and libraries of the books that you see Richard and I talking about. Yeah, so there's uh, universities and empire. There's compromised campus by Sigmund Diamond. Sigmund Diamond, by the way, is also the same uh, editor from Stanford University who did the Solomon's of Rothschild letters from 1861 on the centennial. So in 1961, Sigmund Diamond, Stanford University, republished those letters. But he also wrote the book Compromised Campus. And then there's another book called Cloak and Gown by robin winks that talks it's I all british video. intelligence yeah, yeah it's all british intelligence and infil infiltrating the university systems communism socialism these, these things were born in london by the same people who made up eugenics and malthusian yes. population control british east india company opium subjugate the world narco traffickers the great reset is just it's the legacy of all these things yeah, I remember it's the gangs, the gangster corporations, because that's what that's all it is, right? So why is the FBI director Christopher Ray going over to meet with a bunch of gangster corporations if he's supposed to be sir? Oh, that's who he serves. Oh, okay, that's how it works. Makes more sense. Yeah, they're they're uh, servants of a corporate technocratic uh, control structure, which is intent on bringing a, a real dystopia in. I mean, when you listen to the day tapes, he was talking about the uh, basically turning. Not just turning the frogs gay, but like turning everybody fake and gray. That's in the gay tape, the Doctor Gay tapes. Well, they <laughs> the have trouble tapes. controlling people when parents are making kids and like bringing up kids for eighteen years. They'd rather just grow the children themselves, like Chapter One of Brave New World. Yeah, he talks about they, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. have the test tube babies, right? And I remember yeah. in my university, uh, I went and they actually we had a, actually had a pretty sizable section of Oxford University Press stuff, and I checked out. Um, some of the uh, Galton, uh, not Charles Galton Darwin, but the older Galton. Yeah. He actually gave lectures and talks on um, eugenics pretty extensively. I remember reading an entire eugenics book that he put out of essays and lectures on that. That's all gone. So it's really weird to me that, like, you know what I mean? You can't get, you can still buy this stuff on Amazon, but uh, one thing that the, the day tapes say is that. Um, in the future, books, uh, you won't be allowed to own books. And I was like, that's straight up Fahrenheit 451. But, you know, this is something you talked about, Richard, um, way back in the day, probably 20, 2008, 9. I, I mean, yeah. it was that you were talking about, you know, Kindle, Kindle. is the, the burning <laughs> of books. I mean, now we're seeing the universities being purged. Now we're seeing bookstores going away. You go to towns, they don't have bookstores anymore. There, there, there are very few of these. 
when you go into bookstores, it's not books. I'm talking about like the big corporate stores. It's uh, toys, manga, Funko Pops, all this kind of garbage. You notice that too, huh? You know, I remember being in a bookstore 10, 15 years ago. It was not like this. And I remember being in a bookstore 30, 40 years ago. It was not like this. So this is a recent thing that's going on. Uh, half of it's uh, witchcraft and occult and the other part's manga and the other part's just a bunch of toys for kids that all beep when you walk past the book. Like, it, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it's they definitely are trying to keep real substantial information away from the servitude class, the proletariat. And that tells me that we have the ability to break out if we have information, start thinking, communicating with each other, because that's what they don't want us to do. They want us to watch the next Netflix series drop or whatever, you know, binge on this. Sports, yeah, yeah. Sports ball. In the day tapes, he said, he said that sports would be turned entirely to propaganda to promote globalism. And he said that yeah. we, he said that they would import soccer. Nashville has a soccer team just came in last year. Uh, and that's part of the global soccer, right? Uh, however, this is supposed to work. I don't watch soccer. I've always hated soccer, but um, so sports and soccer are part of globalism. Entertainment, he said, would be engineered to be a tool totally to mind control youth. That's it. it has no other purpose. So now, it, I mean, it used to be entertainment was part of the arts. It was part of Yes. Uh, part of philosophy would be part of um, learning beauty, right? Uh, aesthetics is an element of philosophy. It's part of, it's part of the human experience. Now, entertainment, uh, according to the day tapes, which is now what's where we are. Uh, in the 1960s, they were saying we will turn entertainment into a situation that has nothing to do with the th aesthetics, only to do with mind controlling the the youngest generation. That's it. Well, it's like if they uh, took away all the the layers of government is to see people pointing guns at you to, you know, threaten you with a cage or death. Cause you know, you go to another country and you think, Oh, these people are corrupt because they bribe or whatever goes. No, they just don't have as, as many layers to hide that from you, how it works. Whereas here it's like, Oh, there's justice, but if you don't get justice, well, you're an exception and you know, you're a political prisoner. Sorry about that. But we shouldn't have these sort of things going on in our society. I think it's just another reflection of the absence of intellectual self-defense on the part of the audience and they are they've been accepting offers that they should have said no to you know another book i'm looking forward to getting to and i know you just got it which is this uh, massive beast from stephen dorrell which is the, uh, the critical history of mi6 there's a lot of books out there that are written by the establishment promoting british intelligence and whatnot yeah, this uh, thing's this, like a brick, dude. This is I read the, a lot of books, but <clears throat> this is one of the beasts that's actually yeah. critical of it, and it's it's going to be great to uh, kind of even be perhaps sort of a, a basis for a lecture series. I'd like to do that down the road, you know, with with you have a whole course on the history of British intelligence and geopolitics because I really feel like you can't understand the 20th century without this key component of understanding spycraft. And as you know, but, and probably most of my audience, right? I mean, it's not James Bond. I mean, there's an element to which the sexy stories of, you know, Ian Fleming's James Bond stuff is pulled from some of his missions, but that was all part of psyops to engineer the idea, which by the way is part of cultural engineering that you could live and be James Bond and sleep with whoever you want. It was the creation of sort of a sexual archetype, but re in reality, James Bond works for Spectre. In reality, James Bond is Spectre. British intelligence is Spectre. And they construct and organize the 20th century. And Doral's mainline academic approach has essentially <clears throat> the admission that, uh, yeah, the, the 20th century is run by this same establishment that Quigley talks about. It's run by these steering committees. British intelligence comes out of, is, is a creation of this higher level level Milner group. It comes out of the, uh, uh, the great game, uh, with Russia back in the 1800s. And he, he even gets into some of the secret team people like Fletcher Prouty. He gets into the creation of the OSS and CIA. He gets into, um, false flags. I mean, yeah. this is a mainline text explaining to mainline academics that are getting a high level education in the UK that this is real. This is reality. This is like, you know, the, the same structure, this whole uh, chapter, for example, on, Yugoslavia that gets into um, funding the, the establishment funding the Ustashi, 
the the fascists as well as getting into uh, funding uh, reds and communists. And this is a as lot. well as funding uh, Islamic jihad type exactly. of Muslim Brotherhood yeah. activities that later come back to us in the 21st century. <clears throat> Uh, the funding of different groups, right? This is, this is an entire chapter. Rhodes, and what is this? It's all uh, structured around Rhodes, Milner, Roundtable structures. That's, the, that's this whole section of this. And again, this is not a... I'm having fun with this see? document cam. That, yeah, you, you've got me addicted to this thing now. See that? Does everybody see that? See, do you see this is a mainline megatext? This is not a conspiracy text. He talks about uh, B Berg, B I L D E R, in this. He gets into yeah. um, Lord Rothschild, the fifth man. I did. I saw <laughs> Lord Rothschild in the yep. index. That's one of the first things I check for in a book mm -hmm. to see. Is Artichoke. He telling you about the top level or not? Project Artichoke. Look at that. Horton Down and Project Artichoke. Horton Down, of course, is like Britain's version of bio warfare. Yeah. Um, hopefully, everybody can see that looks like it's pretty good yeah anyway so <clears throat> i think that would be a, a a great lecture series to kind of just take this book and condense it down into um you know a, a course you know the, like what we just did yeah for sure because uh with this book there's also the william stevenson book intrepid, intrepid yeah. there's the bsc book on british security coordination and rockefeller center there's a whole kind of milieu of books, the Irregulars by Jeanette Conant, that go uh, and kind of help you understand. the We, the Americans, didn't have an intelligence system set up. We didn't even have the Secret Service until after they killed Lincoln, right? So we were kind of behind the times in international espionage because America wasn't about that. So here comes our cousins. They've been playing international espionage for like a thousand years. Right. And now they're going to train us on how to do it. So what control do we have in that relationship? It's like chat GPT versus us. <laughs> well, and it's weird that it's a bunch of these kind of weirdos and actors. It's, you know, these Noel Coward and Ian Fleming and yeah. people connected to, again, uh, they all write just, children's books. Yeah. Chitty, they write Chitty, kids bang, books. Bang, Chitty, Chitty, Charlie bang, bang. factory. Yeah. <laughs> the doesn't he, he did. Didn't he do a uh, fantastic Mr. Fox too? the Wes Anderson movie. And that, a, I think, that, <clears throat> I think that's like a, one of these characters, but, um, and they, 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 are interested in kids books in my view because what happens when you go like with the Ian Fleming into psyops and intelligence work is that you want to understand it, uh, human psychology at a very basic level that's why child psychology is really important because human motivations like Abraham Maslow who was one of the MK Ultra doctors by the way that the hierarchy of needs of, of Maslow comes out of MK Ultra research and so man, the manipulation of humans which is what a lot of which is what all of this is really psyops and, and psychological warfare is just human manipulation human compromise um it's just using things like blackmail right i just got this in the mail you may have heard of her has anybody heard of her anybody everybody should have heard of her yeah, right. we've been talking about those books for months right and, so uh, i just got my copies yeah. in the other day uh Shout out to Chris. I think uh, he sent he sent me free copies. So yeah, Chris Milligan's awesome. I mean, I got I got like a, a bookshelf of books from Chris over here. Yeah, I have a book through that you might have heard of. It's called Esoteric Hollywood. I, yeah, I, I have it over just, here. I'm just joking. Man. <laughs> I'm just joking. By the way, so I bought it too. I bought it through the check this out. Yeah. I don't know if I mentioned this. Yet. I just got this in. This is turning into some kind of weird book talk, like coffee talk, book talk. Welcome to coffee talk. Welcome to book talk. Check that cut. out. Look at that. Stars and spies. That looks pretty cool. Yeah, except that he's the guy that writes the mainline crap, right? So he's like the yeah. count he's the counter to Doral. Doral writes more reality and Chris Frangier writes establishment like whitewash. Sure. So but the funny thing about this is I, I I went and read the last chapter because I was curious where he was gonna go with it in terms of modernity. <laughs> he says say so here's the funny part about like the the next phase of James Bond is that Bond is no longer welcome, right? Because Bond is a white dude who's straight, yeah. and toxic it, he, masculinity. It's to, he says Bond is toxic masculinity, and it even says that the anti Bond John Le Carre's George Smiley is now yes. also unwelcome because he's just a straight. He's a nerdy straight white dude. Right. I agree. Yeah. 
but so can't now be that's the circus anymore. Now that's toxic, right? But that, so here's what our uh, British intelligence elites have brought us is a gigantic fake and gray empire uh, that is now pushing everybody cutting off their peepees, right? Is that Unix? Unix are unique and and not anymore. Yeah, and and that, but that's just another version of sterilization. That's what yeah, it's, it's another about. version of subjugation. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm glad of, you mentioned Unix. That's what, yeah, exactly. Unix is yeah, basically it, kind of a, a court slave, basically. Yeah, it is interesting the the chemical castration industry because <clears throat> I know this guy. You know him too. He's the world's most famous veterinarian. His name's Albert Borla. And if you go search our Borla plus Improvac breeding, you'll you'll see him back in 2009. And, uh, you know, if you like bacon that doesn't taste like boar taint, you need uh, to give your pigs Improvac and it chemi chemically castrates them. And Borla became an expert. And that's how he became, you know, a CEO of Pfizer is because he helped with chemical castration successfully 10 years ago with Improvac. And so most people have been taking his advice, like the whole country of Israel is on Pfizer on his, on a veterinarian who's a professional sterilization guy like what's yeah, that yeah. about it's almost like dr mengala yeah and uh <laughs> is, is uh, yeah exactly it's even crazier than what mengala did right it's like the next level right? and yeah then... in some <clears throat> some cases he's he, mengala was uh he had a spectrum of stuff well i'm saying mengala was wasn't able to reach up. as many people as these people have. these people have reached billions of people right yeah i mean think of so fauci was running the whole like psyops behind aids remember that Oh, yeah, 100%. Because uh, there's a uh, Dallas Buyers Club is kind of like a a Hollywood take on that situation. Shit, with the AZT no, no, it ain't now. You trying to say I'm gay? You trying to say I'm fucking gay? <laughs> I can't resist. I have to do it, even if it makes McCona sense. McConaughey just hops in. He just hops in. It's called Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> be a lot cooler if you did all right so the azt fauci you know uh medically experimenting on people i think that's just why he got to have that position he was the guy willing to do yeah, those exactly. things and be like yeah let's put a dog's head with the fleas and let it eat alive that's fine it's mad like science those, stuff dude yeah. it's like it is literal yeah mad science right so darpa likes my mad science and he's like a, a side door for some sort of DARPA projects every now and then, because there's a lot of overlap between Eco Health Alliance and DARPA and NIH's funding of their projects, almost as if they're looking for the same things. But one's the War Department, so why is NIH looking for the same thing as the War Department? That's interesting. <clears throat> because it was all a there. psychological warfare uh, bio operation, right? That's what they've been working on for a long time, and that's what their plans indicated. So while they worked to create this thing that would bond with our ACE2 receptors because they couldn't get a coronavirus to bond with humans from bats, that was a problem that they had to fix in the lab because nature wouldn't do it for them. And then once they had that, they changed the plan to say we could shut down the world under a global pandemic if we had a novel respiratory coronavirus outbreak. And then magically, at the same time they're saying that, they had one on the shelf, and then somehow it got out there intentionally, unintentionally. I don't know, but you could trace it back to who made it. Right. We got means, motive, opportunity. We might not have the smoking gun yet, but we know enough to stay away from that narrative and not to believe those fools. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if you go into the history of um, like spike protein research, that that comes from studies classed loosely under MKUltra in Australia, where they were looking at uh, Kuru mad, mad cow disease. And it wasn't that they were, <clears throat> uh, they were actually looking for a bioweapon. That's what I'm trying to say. Prions. Yeah. They yeah, want to, the, you know, the prion is a bioweapon that they perfected from studying cannibals in Papua New Guinea, which is crazy. <laughs> so why don't, they, why don't they use science for good things? Like, you know, why is it always, they're using the tax dollars to do things to make people slaves? Maybe it's not a government. <laughs> yeah. The government works for this private secret uh, but not super secret, uh, open secret group, which has a public open agendas to do everything that they say they're going to do. And that's the reality guys. If you would hit like and share also, uh, support the show by super chats. You can ask Richard and myself questions. You can also support Richard by going over to grand theft world on Rockfin. You can go to Richard's channel, subscribe there. There's a lot of free content that you also get awesome paid content when you subscribe on Rockfin. 
you get access to everybody, including me, including Rich, including Isaac Vyshop, our buddy over there, including Sam Tripoli, Jason Burmis, Whitney Webb. Um, I mean, Tristan, basically everybody cool is on Rockfin. I don't know how else to put it. Um, there's a couple people that are uh, uh, cool that are not on Rockfin, but I don't know why they're not on Rockfin. They'll get there. They'll get there eventually. Um, and you can also support, what's the best way to support Grand Theft World directly? Is it to... GrandTheftWorld.com and just right. go to the join community and there's different levels to join a community and get a whole ton of resources. Different levels, secret society, yeah. work your way up, become a hierophant of Richard's cult. I'm just kidding. Um, it's a not so secret society. It's an it's an open it's an open secret society. The open the open conspiracy society. Um, did you? Uh, what did you think about the? plan <clears throat> that some of the Anglo-American establishment discussed, I think back in the 1920s, for <clears throat> deindustrializing the West and moving this to China. And I ask that because to what degree do you see, uh, I don't see China as a foil. I know there's a level to which there's kind of a neocon component that, that tries to have this pseudo battle with China. But I think yeah. at a higher at a higher level, um, really, China is just another version of the New World Order, right? I mean, Kissinger yeah. says this. I mean, it, to me, it's the OSS and CIA has basically created modern day China with Maoism. Uh, the OSS was trained by uh, they trained Mao's guerrillas, and then David Rockefeller went and set up, you know, Chase Bank in communist China. It's the whole chapter in his biography on that. Um, I just don't see the Cold War as really anything other than, than a higher level managed dialectic. I read a fascinating book about. Um, Lord uh, Victor Rothschild being a fifth man, yes, uh, and not just a fifth man, but that actually he had a kind of a pre Epstein style stable of blackmail people that uh, that Robert Maxwell and Ghislaine kind of would m modeled it on that model. So um, story is that Victor actually had a stable of not just he didn't just uh, compromise like. Guy Burgess and McLean and the, the Cambridge spiring, he had like 20 people compromised throughout the British establishment, including other uh, elite lords and MPs. And that was a big, um, that was a model for what was then done with like Maxwell and other people. Yeah. The problem with China has been, I mean, it goes back hundreds of years and the history is not with America because we didn't really have a lot to do with China until the British empire uh, and it, you know, Queen Elizabeth the first discovers, you know, that they have tea and silks. And so they start buying a whole bunch of stuff from over there. And then Europe finds out they're standing their gold and, and the Chinese won't trade for European golds goods. So they only take gold and silver. So after a period of time, a couple hundred years, Chinese are sitting on all the European gold and silver and they won't trade for goods. And the Europeans still want to get their tea. They want to get their fix. They want to get the silks, these sort of things. So the East India Company comes up with this idea of, well, we could force them to trade. Well, how does that work? Well, we we take some cotton from south of Amer you know United States, and we bring it over to Manchester, England. We make some textiles, fancy textiles. Then we take those to India, where people can't make fancy textiles. And they say, we'll trade anything for these textiles. And we say, oh, we'll give uh, opium, big balls of opium. And you can look up opium warehouse, India, you know, 1800s, and you'll see, you know, 100 foot high racks of big balls of opium that the East India Company then takes over to China and distributes into their marketplace. Now, the Chinese emperor, he doesn't like this. He sees a deleterious effect on his, his population. So he actually, uh, were, you know, we had the, uh, the Boston Tea Party. We took some East India Company tea. We dumped it in the, the ocean and yay, freedom. Over there, this guy took thousands of chests of opium, turned them into the sea, and said, no opium over here. So the British had two opium wars over in China, and it's called the, the Century of Humiliation, East India Company, also subjugating India, right? So the two places that are supposed to like surpass America, China and India, have been long under colonialism development of a non-freedom-based variety, which gives them direct control command and control whereas over here they got to grease some politicians they got to do some media they got to do propaganda they got to keep the the people at bay these other countries they don't they, like chinese people think freedom's offensive and it's it's a it's something frightening and threatening to them because that's how they've been brought up so 
they're not looking to adopt. They're not that, trying to become free. Well, they and that's also a, that's a, it's a form of bio warfare. Uh, I mean, drug warfare, economic warfare. This are, these are yes. forms of warfare, and so you, we can look to the opium war as a uh, example of this technique that is now being utilized by the same technocratic establishment across America. Uh, and I don't just mean fentanyl. You can you can say yeah, that's one element of this. I'm talking about big pharma is drug warfare on a mass scale. That's why uh, when you turn on your TV at night, if you're a boomer, uh, Fox is telling you nothing but uh, you need to uh, buy all of these pharmaceuticals to heal all of your uh, ailments that the very same technocrats created through fake food and through the terrible diet and living that you have, which is all organized and engineered. All of that is solved by the very thing that it's a problem reaction solution situation where the bad guys are giving you it's like the what's that movie with uh christian bale and uh, equilibrium no the one oh. where uh uh the sillier sillier example where at the very beginning they're like they're going around busting uh windshields out and then the next day they come along and say oh uh, my buddy has a a, a glass uh, that, yeah. glass shop <laughs> i don't know uh i mean i don't know what movie that is but so the one uh, with, uh, I think, Jennifer Lawrence and... Um, okay, it's more recent. It's, it's, I was going to say, I think his first movie, movie was, was Swing Kids back uh, in the day when it was like the anti-Nazi kids back in Germany. Did you ever see that movie, Swing Kids? I have not. Yeah, it's a, it's a good flick. And I'm pretty, pretty sure Christian Bale plays one of the kids who actually turns into a Nazi and then persecutes his friends. and Because the one kid likes to play Django Reinhardt. Uh, Fred Frank Whaley, he used to be a big independent movie star. It was a movie from the nineties about uh, people resisting Hitler in the the time of the rise of the Nazis. American Hustle, that's the movie I'm trying to think of. It's like, oh yeah, right on. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, he is silly in that. American Hustle. Yeah, I think that's based on a true story too, isn't it? Right. Yeah, and yeah. it gets into organized crime and the connection with you know how how the mafia connects into all this, which is a whole other element, which is uh, we've been diving into the last couple of years. If you're over here on my channel, <clears throat> um, yeah, and so so the, I mentioned so you were saying that, you know China's really a sort of a managed dialectic here. Which um, do you see? Do you see this? Basically, are we moving into this phase of the synthesis of the third way of the the blending of Eastern and Western dialectics into this this final phase of a, a full on technocratic global order? Yeah, I think that's the step in their plan for if you need globalism to happen. This is why they set up the Trilateral Commission. David Rockefeller, who also funded Mao, right? He sets up Trilateral Commission, and that helps to bring these Asiatic countries into like this globalist Western kind of uh, you know. Prior to like prior to trilateral, you had Bilderberg and Council of Formulations, but the, they wanted to bring the Asiatic countries and technology companies specifically. So from the trilaterals, you have a guy like uh, David Packard, and he's at trilateral, but he's also Anthony Sutton's boss at the Hoover Institute. And when when Sutton starts getting into this. David Packard comes to him and says, you can't write about that stuff. We can't publish you anymore. We're, you're fired. He's also the guy who fired Steve Jobs. I'm 95% sure that's the same David Packard who has, you know, Hewlett Packard family name to uh, his, his credit. So the, that was one of the, the foundational elements of the Trilateral Commission's technology expansion. And then like Bill Gates and these other people came along later. But Gates' his mom worked for the guys at IBM. So it's a small, small group of people using technology for transhumanism and eugenics and world order. Yeah. They're not that hard to track. Yeah. And I want to add to that. Um, everybody complained about this. This book is back in print has a different cover, uh, because I've been mentioning this for a long time, many years. It's a very important book for the domain of the intelligence apparatus's relationship to the Roman Catholic church and the John Courtney Murray book, uh, about the doctrinal warfare program is back in print. So, uh, yes, you can go order it, go get it. It has a different cover, but uh, that book comes up all the time, and people are complaining, oh, where is it? It's back in print now. By the way, the day tapes I meant to mention, too, when it comes to religion, um, there's a whole section on that where he mentions that, the, that religion is useful, and the major religions would be turned into essentially NGOs or forms of soft power, which will be necessary to evolve 
and promote the world government. So in other words, the, the world religion that they want to set up is just a, a, a form of promoting and preaching the gospel of the world uh, super state. Catholicism, he says, the traditional Western religions, the Bible, uh, Orthodoxy, all these will have to evolve into some form of a new world religion, which, by the way, H.G. Wells has a whole book yeah, on what that the would new be. world it's order is a world religion. That's his well, he has another book, actually, that's lesser known. Uh, uh, Jamie found this. It's called God, the Invisible King, and it's his book about the future world religion. It's pretty wild. But he's basically laying out this same point, which... You might think, oh, H.G. Wells is like, you know, Marxist, socialist. He's going to be an atheist, right? No, actually, he says, I'm not an atheist. I believe in a kind of Lucifer uh, who represents sort of the, the, you know, Promethean power of man to overthrow God and to set up a Luciferian world order. Um, I don't know exactly how authentic that Albert Pike letter is, but it's kind of the same idea here. Even Even if the Albert Pike letter isn't authentic, um, the idea is authentic that we'll have the atheists, the Christians, the Muslims, they'll clash. And then out of that clash, it, it eventually become what they call the, the pure Luciferian religion. I'm just pointing out that, that H.G. Wells says that. He says what Albert Pike says. Well, it also um, ties into the <laughs> thousand points of light reference. And then H.W. Uh, Bush, when he does his New World Order speech, he talks about the thousand points of a light, thousand and that's a points of light yeah. and that's a reference back to him conducting like he's the current day guy who's progressing that plan that's been in place since they wrote about it back then and there's also that uh uh what's it called the, the castle of darkness in brussels there's some some place that has like the a ceiling with the motif of the thousand points of light and that's what it's a reference to having been there for a ritual there's a whole bunch of history to that yeah there's also i think uh one of the theosophists i can't remember if it's Bassant or blavatsky they have a reference to the points of light too um so there's there's a theosophy connection there but um yeah, I just wanted to make this this important point because you know religion is an overlooked, not overlooked by you, but by by people in general. They overlook uh, that religion is a tool, a mechanism of the control structure. Not every every everything or everybody per se, but speaking generally, that that's how they view it, and that's why this book is going to be really important to cover uh, in the near future as well. Which I'm really well, there's enjoying. a couple dynamics to it, real quick, because yeah. a lot of people think like uh, you know someone leading a congregation is controlling that group, and that that's that's true. They're they're influencing that group. That group <clears throat> has trust with that leader. That goes on, but these other people that want to bring everybody together in the world, they just go control that leader. And now they control those people, and this is what the Dallas brothers did with the World Council exactly, of Churches. Exactly, World Council of Churches. Yeah. Yeah, which uh, it does, and that's a Rockefeller created institution, right? Uh, via Fabians yeah. advising them to, you know, set up this kind of a thing, uh, and it's it, that's exactly the kind of institution that is subversive in the way that H.G. Wells was talking about subverting these institutions. But what I'm what's fascinating about this book uh, from Sinicia Glue uh, is that he went into the history of how Platonism evolved out of the Byzantine Empire to influence not just Spinoza, but to influence basically the uh, Enlightenment philosophers who were uh, wanted to set up a socialist uh, global utopia. So Comte, right. St. Simon, St. Just, all those revolutionary socialists out of France, the creators of socialism, uh, the discipline of sociology, not creators, as I meant to say so, uh, sociology, they're all influenced by a Plethon, and if you if you understand Plethon and his atheistic Platonism, then it starts to make sense where we get this idea of get, you see this here, guys. See that illumination and utopia and Plethon. This is yes, talking about the Illuminati, the actual historical Illuminati, who were socialists, who were Jacobins, who were communists. This is what we get with the modern world's obsession with creating a technocratic global government that will control order organize and run everything did you see that world economic forum guy clip uh i don't i put it up today it's been going around but he's saying uh, we've just created the technology is so great which will track everything that you watch do and eat and we will help you understand when you're having uh when you're going over the line in terms of your carbon limits 
This brand new WEF clip. Uh, again, maybe just... Yeah, and I saw it today. It. I retweeted it. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, these people, uh, they have a lot of hubris. I mean, they have big egos. They think they make decisions better for other people than they do, for, like we can for ourselves, which is just, uh, you know, a fallacy. If they're a person, like how do they have special rights that we don't have? Where did they get those rights to tell us what to do? Why can't we tell them what to do? Do we need a bigger megaphone? Is it a fancy stadium? Like what do we need to do to like push back? And that's where people start to learn. Oh, a lot of these things are just made up. And then people yeah. believe things that are not true. And then that, that puts them under control as if they assume. Well, this is, I mean, this is beyond just the, you know, we're going to have a, a, a dot, a quantum dot or, a, you know, tech yeah. tattoo that will track where you go. This is the tech that will decide when and how and what you can eat. So not just eat the bugs, but when you can eat the bugs. And if you've eaten too many of the bugs. Right. And it even said to for one thing that uh, somebody pointed out was a good point, which is that they want to track everything that you look at and where you go. And it's like, how does that, how does what media I consume, how does that affect my carbon, uh, you know, rationing? Well, it has nothing to do with carbon. That's all scams. It's literally mind control. We are made of carbon. Exactly. Trees are made of air, not of soil. They take carbon out of the air and they, they become bigger, right? So it's Bill Gates said, uh, he's not growing trees on his farmland because the soil is depleted. He thinks trees come from soil. He doesn't understand. So trying to get carbon to zero is just a psychopath saying he's a mass murderer, but he says it in a way that people don't get it yet. There yeah, is no carbon, carbon. Mean, uh, cutting right. down on carbon, AKA cutting down on humans. Yeah, right. cutting down on carbon emissions, like you can't get one of these things to zero without killing a lot of people and destroying society as we know it to rebuild it in your image because you think you're God because your family's into eugenics and it's like how you're brought up. So I feel bad for him, but I don't think his messed up situation should infringe on the freedom of billions of people forever. Yeah, and it's, in my view, uh, it's openly like satanic. I don't think he's just, I mean, I don't know that he's himself into Satanism. He may or may not be, but I think that you can be motivated by a spirit, by a kind of a uh, uh, force or power that allows you to believe that you're going to attain this power, that you're going to get all of this from this. And they even believe in, you know, these weird ideas of that you will, that they will achieve technological immortality. Um, which is again these are these are like a cult signs of psychopath slash cult belief exactly S signs of psychopathy and you know we can go back to uh renaissance people like the rosicrucian enlightenment uh thinkers who were experimenting with alchemy to try to create um you know eternal life the, the philosopher's stone all this kind of stuff they think that they're going to create this through technology, but this is a pipe dream because you know consciousness is more than just uh, algorithms and wires. You can't. Doesn't matter how many algorithms you program, you're not going to get a, a self-referential, self-conscious being. And that's why they have to push the idea. There's no such thing as consciousness. That's what Noah Yuval Harari says. While they also tell you, which is a flat-out contradiction, that they'll upload your consciousness to a computer to the cloud. Well, right. how are you going to upload something that you just said doesn't exist, right? So we have to be able to identify basic contradictions so that we don't get duped, so that we're not uh, tricked into believing a bunch of nonsense. And that's especially what Richard does very well, not just at Grand Theft World, but over at the uh, Reason University. You can go to the link. You'll see the Marketplace link there for Autonomy Agora, where you can click on my philosophy course if you're uh, interested in learning philosophy uh, from me. Two different options there. Go do that. I want to remind everybody too that show sponsor is chalk.com, the best supplements that are out there. I take chalk every day. I'm I'm pretty loaded for bear right now because I actually took quite a bit of the Tomcat today. So I'm I'm pretty ramped up. I feel like I feel like I need to fight. I don't know if that's I guess that's just my toxic masculinity bubbling over. Um and that's what happens. It's if you wanna if you wanna get into a brawl, I don't not Richard. I don't want to fight with look it up, see if I'm wrong. Sheila J. Now, though, to uh, experiment with ashwagandha, that's great for uh, mood stabilization. So she's really calm and chilled out when she's taking the ashwagandha. I like efficient. We were just talking about that today. That the the day tapes talk about making food not food. So what people think is food, convenience stores, grocery stores, that's not food. Okay, I mean, like the in, the the outer ring of the grocery store is food. Everything that's not on the outer ring is not food, 
right? So stay away from that stuff. In my view, that's bad news. Irish moss, great for uh, nutrient deficiency as well. Go to chalk.com. You get 50% off by using the promo code JAY50. JAY50, 50% off. But if you want 60% off, use that promo code J60LIFE. J60LIFE. J. But that's for recurring subscriptions. You get 60% off all your purchases because I know that when you get the chalk, you're going to want it coming every month. You're not going to want to put all that information in there. Just do it. It's easy. Head on over to chalk.com. Also, subscribe over to Richard uh, on. <clears throat> All the platforms that are out there, Richard's on Twitter, Richard's on Rockfin, Richard's on YouTube, Richard's on all of the sites. He's very accessible and he's very knowledgeable. He is a, uh, I would say, best historian. Um, I've interviewed a couple historians. But Richard has this breadth that even like PhD historians who are very great in certain areas. But Richard has this breadth that nobody else has. So uh, honored to have you on, Richard. And um, we've been going for an hour and a half. It's, it was a great hour and forty. Great chat. Um, what, what's up next over there uh, on your end? I, I've been I've been keeping up, getting really into Grand Theft World. Uh, seven hour podcast you're putting out every week. This is crazy. Yeah, uh, I'd like to do a show every day, but I don't have time, so I just do it once a week as a hobby, and it usually takes six or seven hours to go through a week of news because we play the clips and then we comment on the clips and we do that to preserve them for the future so people have a. Uh, a sentient understanding of the history that unfolded during this time, since we know that they're only going to be fed propaganda. This is going to be a refreshing. So the gist is uh, I do that every Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern till the wee hours of the morning. And that's a live stream. And right now I, I teach autonomy twice a year and uh, the next session starts in March. So I just graduated season eight students last week. And now I'm going to take a couple weeks off. And so th this was easy. This is one of the last things I have to do before I, I, I start taking time off. And uh, I'm sorry we couldn't do it Saturday night, but uh, the workshop on Sunday went really well. It went four hours. Everybody got more than they paid for. And uh, yeah, I'm ready for a little vacation. If if you guys want to know more, there's a whole bunch of links associated with what I do. Linktree dot rich or slash Richard Grove is the easiest way to uh, to find all the links. Guys, I want to remind you, too, uh, the new live event is coming up. Uh, your favorite philosopher of comedy, BG Cumbie, is going to join us. BG's a, a hilarious dude. We did a funny interview, even though the sound was all jacked up. Uh, but if you go to the link there on uh, Eventbrite, happy to say we're going to be live February 11th, outside or right outside of uh, UT Austin. So it's kind of right in the middle of, of downtown Austin next to UT. The link and everything is right there. Tickets are $45, but it's five hours. You can't beat five hours with me, Jamie, and BG Cumbie. It's going to be fun. You're going to have the absurdity from me. You're going to have hours of lectures from me and Jamie that are not absurdity. And you're going to get absurdity from BG Cumbie. It's a, it's going to be a riot. And everybody loves our live events. We had, I don't know, 120 p people at the last one. And uh, it was a, basically a, a party, dude. It's, it's like, come hang out with um your favorite e-celebrity divas and party with them and learn shit it's not just you know a party it's a learning party so get your lean on and get your learn on at the same time and uh, maybe one day we'll have to have a live event with richard somehow i don't know if we yeah we'll work day. that out like q2 one 2023 day. one day all right richard anything you want to leave us with What's the latest uh, uh, Grand Theft World? So it's about AI. You guys are talking about AI over there. Yeah, we talked a little bit last night, but we also talked about the new Second Amendment ruling where they want to take uh, something that a lot of people have on their rifles and make it illegal and 40 million felons overnight type of thing. And we just covered a lot of the, the the incendiary, irrational stories, and we try to bring logic and reason to it. So it's always good conversation, good deep dives into books every week that uh, you know are spontaneous so i never know what's going to happen during the show so i show up and experience it live with the audience and we have a good time and it's awesome. a good way to invest time on a sunday night guys also remember uh remember this just for no reason at all just remember the blade trilogy just remember it and remember those blu-rays that they exist remember right. uh oh look at that weird book remember that one uh that's another one and then uh, i have books too go order the books at my website jasonalysis.com go to the shop sign copies of every copies of everything thank you much richard and everybody have a oh wait crap we got to read the super chat i almost forgot to read super chats what the heck am i doing i'm gonna tap out thanks jay thanks okay. everybody thanks richard I'll, have a good night i'll catch you around peace <clears throat> oh there we go
find the right buttons here. Let's do the super chats. We got a bunch of super chatters. Yeah, sorry the frame rate was all messed up. It's just crappy connection tonight. Uh, sometimes it happens, but as long as the audio works, we're all good. We got uh, Captain Brunch says for two dollars, an amazing stream, Jay. You and Jamie are a great team. Oh, that was last week or last night. Orthodox Catechumen one dollar. <coughs> he says. Thank you for your work on Orthodox Theology and Apologetics. I've been watching your previous videos on subversion of the church and NGOs. What or what resource or method you would recommend to determine if something like the OCA is under that kind of subversion? I don't know about a specific resource, but um, there are certain jurisdictions within the OCA. Uh, and the way to know that would be to just look and see what their policies were in the last three years and what their policies are about ecumenism, what their policies are about uh, moral stances. So that would tell you all of that. Orthodoxy, $5. Jay, I go to an Antiochian Orthodox church. I'm happy to be there. I'm new. Most of the women there don't wear veils. Paul said that you should wear a veil. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't know why. Uh, for whatever reason, I think there's just a, a lot of Antiochian converts that are just told to not worry about that but i don't know i go to rocor church and everybody wears veils at rocor cataclysm five dollars love your work jay i love you too cataclysm orthodoxy three dollars a friend told me that he believes that humans were larger at the beginning of time and we got smaller because of our genes losing information uh is that strange could be i don't know enough about genetics and seems very speculative so is that the case could be i don't know adam 1912 ten dollars i got your philosophy course i cannot wait thanks for all that you do god bless well there you go there's a happy customer right there who wasn't angry with the costs but that's okay if you know if it's you know if it's too much it's too much but uh i put a lot of time and effort into it so it is what it is Thank you so much, Adam912. Glad you enjoyed it. <clears throat> JML, $40. Big fat super chatter, JML. Thank you so much. <clears throat> In Hol Holdron's textbook, Ecoscience. Oh, uh, Hol Holdron. John P. Holdron. Ecoscience. He, was he simply illustrating eugenic possibilities and techniques? Or was he advocating for it? Oh, I think they advocate for it. Absolutely. <clears throat> And that's what we see in uh, pretty much all of those kinds of texts. I mean, if you, you know, I, I did the uh, Arthur Kessler book, Ghost in the Machine, which is very similar to what you see in ecoscience. Um, <clears throat> it's 100% advocating for it. Absolutely. <coughs> Orthodox Catechumen, $3. What <coughs> ordination title are women prohibited of having in the church? Uh, priest? I've heard that there was deaconesses. Yeah, there was deaconesses very early on in a limited capacity, uh, but nothing like what they want to make it now. So go read uh, Father John Whiteford has a really good essay on deaconesses and what it really was. I would say read that. And the push for that has nothing to do with reviving some ancient, you know, uh, temporary situation in the early church. It has everything to do with pushing towards female ordination. That's it. That's that's the whole thing. And this is all just subversion by the global elites and by what we're talking about. The people, I mean, the Rockefellers behind feminism. They're the ones that bankrolled it and uh, turned it into an actual movement. It's in the uh, authorized biography of the Rockefellers. I've covered that chapter many, many times. Guys, if you would hit like and share. Also, uh, share the show. Support the show. We don't get algorithmic promotion. It's up to you guys. Um, and thank you to all the mods for sharing a lot of the uh, sources for tonight's show. And uh, everybody have a good night.